so today I'm just going to briefly outline the uh, kidney and extra-renal manifestations of polycystic kidney disease. And as you all know, um, ADPKD is a systemic disease. Um, I'm going to cover um, just some selected areas in the guidelines, and we appreciate if you could provide feedback um, when you get a chance to look through them. Um, so I'm going to cover uh, a number of topics um, in kidney manifestations, hypertension, chronic kidney pain, hematuria, uh, kidney stones, urinary tract infections, and then I'll finish off with um, polycystic liver disease. So the management of hypertension um, is uh, straightforward and follows um, other guidelines in terms of uh, management at, in ADPKD. Um, generally, uh, healthy dietary and lifestyle interventions should be incorporated uh, into the management of blood pressure. Um, also, in terms of blood pressure targets, um, there's a designation between age groups, so ages between 18 to 49 in stages one to two chronic kidney disease. Uh, we, uh, the KDGO recommends uh, reducing blood pressure to less than 110 on uh, 75. And those patients who are over the age of 50 or more advanced uh, stages of chronic kidney disease, uh, KDGO recommends a um, a higher blood pressure target, but below 120 uh, systolic. And um, the treatment, pharmacological treatment, um, renin angiotensin inhibitors are recommended as first line, either ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. And as you all know, avoiding the combination of the two um, is, uh, is, is recommended. Um, moving on to chronic kidney pain, um, as you know, chronic kidney pain is a, a significant problem in patients. It's um, often overlooked in clinical practice at times, um, and uh, the pain can be um, in, expressed in multiple areas, um, in the flank, the abdomen, the lumbar region, and it's important to rule out um, other causes of pain um, apart from ascribing it to be due to um, the kidney itself. Uh, particularly looking for mechanical back pain um, or other um, conditions that may be associated, such as malignancy and keeping an open mind, and of course, um, uh, infection or stones as well, so a broad differential diagnosis. Um, chronic pain that's refractory and persistent uh, should be managed by a, a multidisciplinary team, often involving a, a team of um, specialists aside from the nephrologist, radiologist, chronic pain specialist, and um, uh, psychology and psychiatry as well may be required. And in managing this complex problem, it's a very individualized approach. Um, shared decision-making um, is required in understanding the problem and the impact it has on the, on the patient. Uh, Non-pharmacological and non-invasive interventions are first-line treatments. Um, Moving on to more uh, uh, detailed management, as illustrated in this diagram, um, from uh, progressive uh, pharmacological treatment, um, opioids, um, starting from paracetamol and moving on to tricyclics. Um, I won't go through the detail of this. And then finally, invasive uh, therapies here in the in the middle. Um, so there's not a uh, a, a, a uh, standard approach, it's a generalised approach that's individualised, but taking into account all of these um, components, depending on the patient. Moving on to kidney stones, um, as you know, kidney stones, are ha there's an increased um, prevalence of kidney stones in patients with polycystic kidney disease, and this is due to uh, the distortion of the uh, nephron segment due to polycystic kidney disease, uh, as well as alterations in the, uh, the chemistry of the urine. Um, due to the uh, dis disrupted tubular segments. And so it's important to ask about a history of kidney stones in patients. Um, certainly it may be detected as an incidental finding in imaging. Um, and whether you should screen uh, for kidney stones in a selected patient should be individualised based on the history and the, uh, and the overall presentation. Um, patients with polycystic kidney disease and kidney stones should undergo uh, the 24-hour urine testing to look for lithogenic uh, risk factors, uh, serial imaging, uh, a standard approach that we would use for anyone who's got uh, kidney stones. 
the guidelines, KDGO guidelines, follow um, similar recommendations to that recommended by other um, bodies, uh, such as the Canadian Urological Association, and um, these suggestions include um, maintaining good fluid intake or good water intake to achieve a urine output of more than 2.5 litres per day. Um, and certainly, as we know with other um, uh, populations that are uh, risk factors such as uh, being overweight, metabolic syndrome uh, is an important uh, uh, additive risk factor in causing kidney stones and that this should be, um, should be treated appropriately. And also, uh, as uh, we'll hear later, dietary management is very important. A registered dietitian uh, can be involved in terms of reducing solute intake, reducing weight. Uh, this can all be beneficial in uh, preventing uh, recurrent stones. Um, in terms of moving on to hematuria, uh, the most important aspect is to, I think, one, is to highlight that an episode of hematuria can occur in the natural history of patients with polycystic kidney disease and it's an important educational um, advice that could be given um, to patients when they present to clinic for the first time or certainly in recurrent visits because the, um, the observation of an episode of hematuria can be quite alarming and uh, so providing that education or warning the patient that this may occur with trauma or with minimal trauma or spontaneously is important because that can lead to a lot of worry and I think that's a, a very important point to make. Um, again, moving very quickly to other complications, uh, urinary tract infections. Um, again, um, the KDGO guidelines um, follows recommendations that are made by other bodies. Um, as we know, we shouldn't treat uh, patients who have asymptomatic bacteria. Um, first line antibiotics are really dependent on the local um, results obtained and the, uh, the prevalence of multi-resistant organisms uh, and encourage you to just follow your local practice in terms of antibiotic choice. This is a, a, a diagram. Uh, the, word, it, the wording is a little bit small, perhaps, um, but uh, essentially this is a, a flow diagram which is discussing um, urinary tract infections. And uh, if I can just take you through that very quickly. Um, so, um, patient with suspected kidney cyst infection. So this is an important differentiating factor than infections from the urinary tract itself. Uh, these patients can sometimes be difficult to diagnose. The symptoms can sometimes be nonspecific, but the presence of high fever, abdominal pain, elevated C-reactive protein, elevated white cell count, and a patient who's chronic, who is unwell uh, should prompt the consideration of um, a kidney cyst infection and uh, the process would be to uh, perform imaging to exclude other uh, potential causes in this setting and then um, uh, uh, suspicion of a cyst infection and treatment with antibiotics. Um, in some cases where there is persistent um, infection, the use of uh, more specialised imaging to clarify the diagnosis can be used and uh, that's summarised in, in this section here. The main important point to draw on, which will be covered in the next slide, is that um, people who have cyst infections need a more prolonged duration of antibiotic therapy, uh, four to six weeks, as opposed to standard urinary tract infections where um, a cystitis episode will require treatment for uh, five to seven days. The second point to make about cyst infections is the importance of using a lipid-soluble antibiotics which penetrates the cyst and this is based on some older studies. And I think one of the important things to mention uh, about, the, uh, about the body of work is that uh, the amount of evidence that's available in literature is also limited as well and we need more studies to um, uh, provide more, more evidence. Moving on to renal cell carcinoma, um, overall, um, there is, uh, is no clear association with the risk of renal cell carcinoma, but the important practice point is that uh, because of the very distorted uh, kidney anatomy, uh, the diagnosis of renal cell carcinoma can be challenging and there can be atypical presentations. So just moving on lastly to polycystic liver disease. Um, so in screening for liver cysts and uh, polycystic liver disease, it's important to consider that at the outset uh, when the patients present uh, 
at the initial diagnosis, and it's important to include um, imaging of the liver at that time, either um, with ultrasound, CT, or MRI. And again, um, similar to hematuria, it's important to talk to patients about uh, liver cysts um, and explaining um, the natural history and uh, the association with liver cystic kidney disease, and the vast majority are asymptomatic, but in some cases can progress on to uh, more severe polycystic liver disease, which we'll talk about. Uh, this diagram just illustrates uh, some of the symptoms of very severe polycystic liver disease, uh, the very non-specific symptoms of um, when the liver is massively enlarged and that there is symptoms of ab abdominal fullness, um, fatigue, reduced um, uh, uh, or early satiety leading to weight loss uh, in more severe cases. Um, I'm also listed here is acid reflux, which is a, a in discussing with patients, a very common symptom um, and certainly um, more uh, severe in, in severe polycystic liver disease. And lastly, also to mention that these liver cysts can also get infected and can sometimes be a very difficult diagnosis to make. Uh, the risk factors are more common in females and therefore the, the female sex hormone seems to be a, a risk factor and therefore um, it's important to talk about the, the pathogenesis to patients and also the benefits and harms of uh, pharmacological treatment with um, uh, estrogens, um, which are uh, associated with um, uh, increased in um, liver size. Um, a lot of these studies incriminating the uh, estrogen, pharmacological estrogen with polycystic liver disease are observational and um, the associations are most marked um, in patients who are under the age of 45, and the rate of increase of using pharmacological agents su such as estrogen over the age of 45, the rate of liver growth is, uh, is less, far less. Um, polycystic liver disease, um, there are no specific diets uh, to treat um, or prevent the formation of liver cysts. Um, and essentially management is supportive, um, preventing the very severe um, malnutrition that sometimes can occur with um, uh, severe polycystic kidney disease, and again, involving a registered accredited practicing dietitian in, in this as a multidisciplinary team is important. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the risk factors. Um, again, the use of, um, there's, a lot of evidence um, for long-acting somatostatin analogues in improving quality of life and reducing um, volume-related symptoms in patients who have severe polycystic liver disease. Um, so when using long-acting uh, somatostatin analogues, um, the um, uh, progress with, that, uh, with those agents should be evaluated after six months. Um, and other pharmacological treatments um, that have been studied in the literature, uh, deoxycholic acid, mTOR inhibitors, um, should not be used um, in the setting. They have no, there's limited evidence and no efficacy. And certainly a common question that comes up is, does uh, vasopressin receptor antagonists work for liver cysts? And the answer for that is um, no and should be used. As we'll talk about in a minute, in my case, um, Patients who have very severe polycystic liver disease uh, should be referred for uh, multidisciplinary team and considered for liver transplantation. And in these cases, combined liver kidney transplantation may be considered if the GFR is below uh, 30. Um, again, I won't, uh, in the interest of time, won't go through this diagram, but the approach, this is, uh, diagram just illustrates the approach to um, liver cyst infections and management of liver cyst infection. And um, there is a range of other extra renal features uh, as illustrated in this diagram, um, cardiac disease, uh, aneurysms, which um, I won't go through this evening. I wanted to finish off with just a, a case. Um, I think the severe patients with severe polycystic liver disease with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease are, for me, the most complicated patients um, that I've dealt with who have polycystic kidney disease. 
And this is a, a lady who, or a, a patient that we looked after, or we still look after, who's a, a robotics engineer with the Royal Australian Navy. Um, she uh, was referred to um, the unit at the age of 34. Um, she presented in 2010 with the diagnosis of ADPKD, and uh, that was diagnosed during her first pregnancy. Uh, she was found to have liver cysts and kidney cysts. And three years after that pregnancy, um, her liver growth uh, accelerated markedly. Um, and there was a, a, a marked increase in liver volume, uh, more so than the total kidney volume. And she did uh, start on um, somatostatin analogues, lanreotide, and that improved her symptoms. Um, she reported um, unable to go carry out her work. Um, she was um, losing weight, she was malnourished. Um, she was concurrently referred to the liver transplant team. Uh, she did want to have a second pregnancy and um, she was counseled against doing this because of the exposure to estrogen and the ovarian stimulation and, and decided not to proceed with that at that point. And she was listed for a liver only transplant um, because her kidney function was well preserved and she had very mild um, kidney disease. And initially she was offered a, a liver in July of 2016, but she was so petrified uh, about this and so she declined it. But fortunately, a month later, um, she, have a, she had a liver transplant performed and she remained on prednisone and tacrolimus, had a marked improvement in her overall quality of life. Um, she reported that uh, the liver was like she was pregnant and post-transplant, uh, it was just an incredible improvement to her symptoms. And then she went on to actually have a second pregnancy um, last year and um, currently she's well with EGFR of 90. I, ha I only see her once a year because the hepatologist sees her more often um, monitoring liver transplant, but um, we'll keep an eye on her kidney function. So I'll finish here and uh, thank you for your attention.